Okay, so let's start. Let me just start my timer. There we go. Hello there. Uh, not sure about what is your relationship with uh, Tech Depth. I don't know if you love or hate. I actually like to work with it, especially when it comes to remove code from the code base. For me, the PR removing stuff is magical. And I wanted to share with you some things that I learned along the way. Uh, so let's start. So let me introduce myself. My name is Felipe Sales. I'm a software engineer from Brazil. Now I'm living in Milan. So I moved a couple of years ago. And I started my career at Vitex, which is a e-commerce platform. And at Vitex, we were responsible for the post-purchase of it. So not only what the customer would see on the storefront, like the orders page and so on, but also what they, uh, the merchant would use to customize and manage their e-commerce. So that uh, I spent there four years ago in Vitex. And then I moved to Klarna, which is a fintech company from Sweden. And on Klarna, I'm also working on the post-purchase, but more on the payment side. So after you buy with Klarna, you have, you have to pay Klarna back. And that when you're going to see my, my uh, our screens, right? So two very different companies in terms of culture and uh, the segment, but they are both very new. And I found tech depth in both of them. One thing that I'm, I'm proud of or what I did on Vitex, for example, was when I arrived there, our code base was basically Backbone JS. I'm not sure if you heard of it. It's kind of old uh, framework, previous than React. It was like a part on Backbone, part on React, and the part that was in React was not even TypeScript at the time. So by the time that I left Vitex, uh, we managed to convert the code base fully on TypeScript and React and get uh, to drop the Backbone part. And here on Klarna, uh, when I arrived in, uh, at our team, we had to manage six node uh, JS applications, which was kind of heavy because we were like six developers, so it was one application for, for each developer to manage. And in two years, we managed to decommission four, four applications, so that made our lives way easier. So, uh, the first thing is I want to clarify what I mean by tech depth that I found out that I didn't knew about tech depth until I had to research this presentation. Because like it was a term that appeared, but uh, I never knew actually where it came from. And the definition of the word, actually, it is from 1992. Uh, it's from Walt Cunningham. And the context was he was trying to explain to a stakeholder why he had to refactor the code base before he had to actually implement the, uh, the feature which I believe that we can all relate. Uh, it was a small talk application in the financial sector. That's why they, he made a, a comparison with depth. And this, the simple definition is, we developers, we make some trade-offs to meet some deadlines. And then if we don't fix that uh, fast enough, that's gonna make our life harder in the future. So although, I understand this definition. What I had in my mind, it was not only that. I feel that it's lacking a bit. And I started to research more and I found a paper and it gives th this definition that I think at, the, at least on my mind it fits better because it's the first one that brings also the quality. So it's not only what we developers uh, didn't deliver, but also a comparison in terms of quality, right? So imagine that you had application on 2008 in jQuery. And at that time, your application would be perfect to the standards of the, the epoch, right? Because jQuery was the go-to technology at that point. But then if you translate that code base to nowadays, it's harder to find people that actually know what is jQuery, like the uh, junior, they don't even heard of this technology anymore. It's harder to find support, although there is a version 4 in beta of jQuery. I don't know if you are into that. But anyway, uh, that's what, what I like, because when you start comparing with uh, a quality in mind, you see that it broadens a lot the scope, right? And that's 
when I think about the tech debt, my definition is uh, that code that fails your cor current quality standards. And I'm, I mean to highlight the current because I also believe that our standards evolve over, over time, right? So what you believe to be the perfect architecture today, it might change at six, six months from now when you learn about a new pattern, you acquire new skills, the technology around you changes. So uh, I believe that uh, your quality standards also changes. But regardless of the definition that you choose to adopt, I believe that we all have in mind about the consequences of it, right? So. If for me, it translates a lot in a feeling of uh, a kind of anxiety every time that you're gonna touch on the code base, because perhaps you are not familiar enough with that uh, tech stack. Perhaps it's missing documentation or it's missing tests, and then you're afraid of touching that, and you might not do what you believe that would be the best approach ever. You just go there, fix what you have to do, and then go away. And uh, I believe that we can all relate with that. So we want to change it, but then we always have this uh, in discussion with a uh, business stakeholder, because although we know the benefits of it, it's hard to quantify, it's hard to put a metric, because on our business backlog, we have generally features, uh, and they can even predict how much money the company will gonna make with that feature. But then can you say that if you change the tech stack, you're going to be 50% more uh, faster? The, are you going to decrease it in half, the bugs? So it's hard to compare, and it's not even fair to compare tech depth with uh, business backlog because we don't have this kind of metrics. And that's what I learned, and that's why I found out that we should figure it out ourselves and not rely on the product side. So. My approach, oh sorry, <laughs> my approach to it, it's basically these three pillars here. So first we're gonna assess what is the problem that we have, what is the symptoms that we are feeling. And then we're gonna create our definition of quality because uh, going back to definition, uh, you have to have a definition of a quality so you can actually say that this is a tech depth and what is not. And after what we're gonna work towards that definition. So, uh, to evaluate the situation, I'm using the same thing that we do on the end of free to do a retro. So, figure out the things that you actually like on your code base and you think that you should encourage to do it. For example, in my team, I like that we do, every time that we make architectural decision, we write an ADR document close to the code base that is being affected. And that's very good to document the decision and give the context to the people in the future. So I think that's one thing that we should keep doing. Uh, afterwards, we, we can figure out the things that we want to have. Let's say I want to have a full end-to-end -end test that with zero mocks, so I can actually hit all the dependencies. That would be an example of things that we, we could have. Uh, and the last two, I think they go uh, very tight to couple because the pain points they're gonna point you to a direction but it's important to figure out the, the actual root cause what i mean by that let's say that you feel that you're uh, losing productivity because you're waiting too much for a pipeline to run for example but then you have to figure out okay what should i do should i ditch the ci integration or you look deeper, you see that the problems are the tests, it's taking too long to, to run the test, but okay, is it the test framework or is the kind of test that you're running? So really try to understand what is the, the problem that is causing the, this pain point. And we'll, after you have this di diagnose, we can start drafting a standard. And the idea of this standard, it's exactly to define a baseline of quality. So you stop any code from coming into your code base that don't meet that quality criteria. So we're gonna stop producing more work to you in the future. Uh, this is also important to bring this alignment between the team members, right? Because it's not what you think what is quality, but it all what the team decided and agree that uh, it, it is quality. 
a good side effect of having this documented in a, a set of rules is actually uh, because facilitates to onboard new people to your team. I know I don't know if you ever had that feeling that the first pull request that you do with two line changes and then you get like 50 comments on it because you don't really know how that team operates, right? You don't know what is the expected. So instead of having someone like to explain every time that's, uh, that a newcomer comes, we just say, read this. This is what we expect of quality. And there's a, the last one is a tip that I like to give. It's always not only having the rule, but also the why we are creating that rule. Because the your surroundings can change. For example, uh, you might create a rule to say uh, all the endpoints that I have should have an uh, end-to-end -end test because you're feeling that you have too many bugs on your application and you want to ensure that you not have the, those bugs anymore. But then if your application grows too much, in the future, end-to-end -end tests are kind of expensive. So you have to give the context for the person in the future, okay, do we still have this problem or can I perhaps convert this end-to-end -end test to integration test? So it's good to expl explain the why. Okay, cool. Now we have our definition of quality. It starts to, it's time to actually start to move into that direction, right? And uh, one approach that I like to use is what I'm calling organic here is to actually use the, your business backlogs as an excuse to also tackle your tech debt. So you're not going to say to your uh, product manager, oh, I'm going to stop to write tests. I'm going to write the tests while I'm also writing the features. So the beauty of this is exactly because you don't have to ask for time. You are just doing your regular work. And uh, it, it turns out that it's very effective in the long run because you are always pushing your code base quality uh, up after the long time. The only downside of it, it's the same downside of any refactor because since you are touching more places on your code base, you can introduce some regression. But if you are, uh, if you do TDD, actually that's one of the biggest of arguments of using TDD. It's a lot exactly to protect yourself against uh, undesired side effects. I'm not a big TDD fan myself, but then if you already do it, having a test suite is going to go for it. And that actually comes from uh, the Boy Scout rule in the, the clean code. So I like when Robert said that oh, ev every time that you leave your code base, you leave it better than when you found it. So it doesn't matter if that thing is exactly tied to the test that you came from the code base. You just go there and change it. Of course, you have to be uh, mindful about the size of the pull requests and so on. So, But then uh, I think we can learn with time. So let's put that into an example. Let's say that uh, my definition of quality is that all, all of my endpoints should have at least integration tests tied to it. And on my front end, I only accept front end written TypeScript from now on. So if you get a, a feature request to add a filter to the customer orders page, now we gain the opportunity to write integration tests to the endpoint and also convert the code base to TypeScript. So that's it. it you didn't have to do it, but then you get gain the opportunity to actually tackle it. And afterwards, even if you uh, decide to remove the feature, actually your code base is already better because you already have tests and it's already in TypeScript, for example. Another approach that you can use, it's pretty s straightforward. Uh, it's just about c as designing, uh, asking for a product manager for a time to do it. Let's say the last Friday of the month, I'm gonna dedicate to work on tech depth. So you sit down with your colleagues, split down the code base, and then you just tackle this. So it's very easy to implement. It gives results pre uh, pretty fast. So depending on the, the situation that you're having, it might be a good one. And actually you can, combine both of them, uh, they are working independently. The only problem with it is because you actually have to ask for the time to the product manager. So, I mean, it depends on your, your situation. 
Uh, what I wanted to convey on this uh, pr presentation is actually tech debt is uh, not a problem, but it's a consequence of our, our work. Because even if you don't improve your code base, you believe that it's 100% is perfect, the technology around you is evolving, and you're going to have to keep up with it at some point. So just adding features and improving the only the product, it's not going to cut it. Even though, for example, if you don't update your dependencies, you might end up having security issues. And then when they found the security issues, you're going to have to do like three merger versions at once just because you are not updating and keep uh, uh, with the, the updates there. So I believe that we should all learn how to, to deal with this in a regular basis. And that's pretty much the approach that I use. I believe that having a standard is also good, spe specifically to avoid conflicts between team members, right? Because sometimes we get caught up in arguments in pull requests. And when you have a, a standard like that, it's not what I think, it's not what you think, it's what the team decided that is quality. So you c you don't have a problem with pointing fingers anymore because you have a third party, which is the the team that actually decide that. If you want to change it, if you don't agree, okay, it's fine. Bring it up to the team, and the team uh, can vote again to decide. So I think it, regardless of whether it's the tech that, that you're uh, going to tackle, but having this standard, it's a good practice exactly to improve your communication. Uh, and that was pretty much it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed.